now I am going to introduce the speaker for the day. Uh, it's my husband, Garrett Snyder, giving the sermon. All right. Well, thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> I'm back. <No. laughs> That's why I always like to offer other people to pray, and then I'm like, oh, whoops. But, um, and everything, too, because I always think I talk too much sometimes. <laughs> I like to spread the blessings to others to pray to and, and to have blessings. All right. Well, at this time, I'm going to enter into a very short prayer uh, before we begin. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for with, uh, being with us today. Uh, we ask, Father, that you be with us and that you be with me and that, that your word would speak through me today, this, that, this, that your will be done uh, in my life, too, and also the lives of our congregation. And also, let your will be done and that you speak and that your words come through me. And that you show me also your ways and continue to guide me and humble me and walk with me also uh, as we deliver the message this morning. And in Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. All right. Let's see if I can find my notes. Uh, they're right here. Good. I always trust paper. but <laughs> That's just me, though. I like, I'm starting to get more familiar with technology as things go along. So, and that, and that brings me to my next part, part two. So... We talked about what community is and that community um, a few weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I guess it was. Um, we talked about community and the importance of it, and also that community existed. We, we focused on Acts chapter 1 and 2, especially, and then some in 3. And then you could see the progression through Acts um, that the, the body of Messiah kept growing continually. So that, that's just a brief review for you. And I, and I gave you the, the Greek words and the Hebrew words for, um, that were relevant also for that. that you can, you can always go back and look on that on the archive messages if you ever want to look at another part of a series or one of the elders' messages or, um, or some of the drashas too. Uh, it's a good resource. But starting with this part, I'm going to try to touch on a few things here. We are one body who works together in unity to produce fruits and to glorify our Father in heaven. So... I've said this a few times too. You'll hear that producing fruit, producing fruit, and glorify Father quite a bit uh, throughout uh, Scripture. But those are really, really important principles uh, as believers because producing fruit doesn't mean you're actually growing an actual vineyard, which is pretty cool if, you, if you're doing that, though. That's pretty good. Yeah, uh, but it is a metaphor for producing spiritual fruit, and I'll get to that verse uh, as we go further on. Uh, it'll come up again. But the whole part of that is what is produced in us spiritually as followers of Yeshua is fruit. It is something that has produced something that is pleasant, something that is good, that's something that Yeshua has instructed us to do, to have peace, hope, love, patience, temperance, um, to have long suffering, to, to bless those in need, bless those that are around us, those that we don't know, and those amongst our own community, that we show who we are not just today, but every day of our lives, that this isn't a show. This isn't something that you just play dress up for. You know, that's not why, why we're here. You know, we're here to worship God alone, our Father in heaven, through Yeshua. So that's pretty much our focus that we have. We produce that fruit, and then we glorify God because of that. And it makes our lives whole when we do this. You know, and, and that's the amazing part of it. The mission of this part two of the series is to show us that we work together in community. So we found out what community was, and then it grew. We found that in the New Covenant and Acts especially, but we also now are shifting gears, and we're going to show what we could do together in community. Um, this is made possible through Messiah, Yeshua, who is not only the head of the community of faith, so the, the head of the body of Messiah, but the one who holds it together also. We are to love each other and to love our Elohim following after him and seeking his ways. One should not become isolated because he feels unworthy or unqualified. But rather, one should take part as they are called. I'm going to stop there for just a second. So that's really important, too, before, we, before the slides. I haven't gotten there quite yet. But it's really important to, to if you feel guilty, uh, this, we'll touch on guilt just a little bit today, or if you feel unworthy or you feel like, well, I don't know, I don't know the Hebrew, I don't know the Greek, or I don't know what's going on, I don't know the culture, the culture of Scripture. Maybe you're new to the Scriptures. Maybe you've never read the Bible before. And maybe this is the first time you've ever tuned in or, or, or that you're here today that, you've, that you're coming back to the Scriptures, like you grew up with it, but you've kind of put them aside. 
or you, you kind of went your way, but now you're coming back, that God restores those who come to him, no matter where you're at. But the main thing is coming back to him because there is blessing in that. It's not all about bless me, bless me. You know, I've talked about that before. You will be blessed, but you're blessed because you come before him and you bless him. Um, real quick, too, one thing I'm learning a lot uh, on the side in our Zoom class, uh, I'm, I'm taking a lay cancer class on Sundays, and it's been amazing. We meet once a month on Zoom and, uh, at 7 o'clock, and Rabbi Aaron does a great job explaining um, so much about what the prayers are and how they're spoken and, and like, why we bend our knees. Like, the, uh, throughout the Amidah, actually, there's four places where you bow, so we were bowing in a few places too much, uh, wherever it says Baruch Atah, I don't know. But, um, but there's, there's a reason for that. Every knee will bow, and if there is someone that he makes straight the bent, that's why we come up when he, we, Adonai, you come up. He is the one that straightens the bent, and every knee bows before him. So there's meaning in every, everything that is done, and it's just amazing seeing that part of the community that is not part of our immediate community that is interacting with each other. And that's really awesome. But uh, guilt, shame, or pride should not keep us from involving ourselves in community. So if you feel shy, if, you're, if, you're, if you feel like you're t not worthy, like I, I've just sinned too much, all these people in here are, are beyond where I'm at, I don't think I can really give anything. But that's not true. You, you can. And it doesn't matter if you know the tech. Like I said, Ellen's been really helping me with the computer stuff and the technology and the sound things. I mean, like, I'd be like, I, that's not my gift or calling. I don't know anything about that stuff. So I, I have some help. But I contribute my, what, I, what my part is. You know, I, I love to sing. I love to praise with liturgy. It's, it's beautiful. I love that culture. But everyone has their own uniqueness, even here today and those that are watching as well. You all have a uniqueness in the body of the Messiah. So don't feel like, you, you can't contribute to it or that you would rather not because you'd rather someone else do it. But you are also called to participate in community, that you are also a part of the body. Uh, moving to uh, the first slide, Colossians 1.18. Uh, this is going over to first. First and foremost, uh, Yeshua, he is the head of the body, his community. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in all things. So that's the number one thing to remember in community. It isn't necessarily all of us first. It's him first. He's the one that is the head, but he is also the one that holds it together. And going with that, you'll also find the words of Yeshua in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be with you and your joy may be full. And you know, reading throughout the scriptures throughout life and everything, I was just like, that really hit me the other night. I was just going through different scriptures and I was like, trying to find things about community specifically because I said, well, you have a part two and I wanted to do something about unity. But when I saw this, I was just like, I, I was praying. I was like, Father, let your will be done. You show me. And I just sat there for a while and just kept saying that. And I kept skimming through the books. And I was like, I'm going to turn here and see what we have, you know, and, and then reading it. And that one popped out and I was like, whoa. And it's very simple. You know, the commands aren't a burden. First of all, and a lot of, in our culture, and a lot of, a large portion of the body uh, thinks that the laws are, are burdensome, or that they hold you back, or that they were done away with, or they were nailed to the to the cross, or nailed to the execution stake that Yeshua was on. But no, He came to make them make more sense, to bring them to their fullness, so they could be done, because of the Ruach Hakodesh, the Holy Spirit that's in us. That's what allows us to continue to keep them, and in doing so. We are abiding in his love, that we follow him more closely to his words, because his words are the Father's words. I was just, that was profound, and that his joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. So like I said, it goes kind of back to that guilt a little bit there, you know, where you don't have joy, or you feel guilty, or you feel incomplete. But following after him, 
No matter where you're at, step by step, this isn't a race. You know, this is a relationship. It has to be built. It can't be forced, and it can't be manipulated. It has to grow one step at a time. Israel has been long compared to vineyards. It was Hashem who planted them, and it was He who has made them spread out and prosper. And then I'm going to turn your attention now to Ezekiel 17, verses 5 through uh, 6. And if the verses don't line up too, I noticed like that in the Haftorah today, you saw the English version. So if you had a tree of life or a complete Jewish, it was a, little, it was a few verses off. So if you ever see that in parentheses, that, that's the English uh, translations, just to let you know. So Ezekiel 17, 5 through 6. Then he took some seed of the land and planted it in fruitful soil. He meaning Hashem, our Father. He planted it beside abundant waters. Set it, um, he set it like a willow twig. Then it sprouted and became a low, spreading vine. When its branches turned towards him, but its roots grew underneath him. So it became a vine, produced branches, and sent out shoots. So, of course, that's talking about a prophecy of things to come. Of course, you'll, you'll, you're welcome to read ahead of that, too. I wanted to just pick one of those. Uh, the, the essence of that scripture I was leaning towards was Israel is compared to a vineyard. And you'll see my point um, to come here. We should seek to use our callings and our gifts, not boasting in our own abilities, but glorifying him who has given us the gifts. So with that being said, too, we, we read ahead in John, remember, too, abiding in his love, you know, that, that he makes our joy fuller. And inviting in him, too, he is the true vine that we read later in the new covenant. We read that Yeshua is the true vine. But we also see back in Ezekiel before that, that it was he who planted the seeds, who makes abundant. But what is that soil? It was his promises. It was his, his law, his Torah. It was, it was the foundation that grew because he planted them there. And then they grew forth and actually became a vine. But, as, but in essence, he is the one that made the vine possible. He's the one that actually is the true vine. The one that holds all the fruit. One that holds it all together. So you could see some of the parallels throughout. And there's so many scriptures that you could pull. I could actually, there was actually like 17 different verses or different scriptures I was going through. And I was like, oh my. So you could keep seeing that about vineyards, vineyards, vines throughout scripture. And they're all related to Israel. And how he was cultivating his plan. So, seeking our gifts and callings. Explaining, uh, I'll explain this uh, blessing. Um, this is also an interesting point too because this kind of goes back to spiritual gifts a little bit. And you can read more about that too uh, in detail. I didn't go so much into detail about the actual particular gifts. But in Romans 12, 3 through 5. For through uh, the grace given me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to use sound judgment, as God uh, has assigned to each person a measure of faith. So that's that uniqueness that we all have. For just as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do, do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body and Messiah, and every one, uh, and every one parts Everyone parts of one or part of another. Sorry, tongue, tongue twist there. So all of these parts are working together. It's just like a machine almost if you want to be more mechanical in the mindset of it instead of more organic. Either way would work for an analogy. But the really important thing is it all works in unison. And, it, and then later uh, we'll see too that the body can't say, well, the hand is the whole body. If you don't look like a hand, then you're not part of the body. You know, and that's not how it works. The hand is part of it. The hand has to be supported by what, right? I, I mentioned this before, the wrist, right, and et cetera, et cetera, and to, onto the torso. The whole, the, whole, the whole body is connected. Not one part is the whole body. That's just a part. Just like a gear cog that's missing, it can't turn if one part is missing. So, Romans 12, 10 through 11. Be tenderly devoted to one another in brotherly love. Outdo one another in giving honor. Do not be lagging in zeal. Be fervent in, in, in spirit. Keep, uh, keep serving the Lord. So this is another thing, too, that 
a lot of us sometimes will get behind on or in our culture. Our culture kind of supersedes our mindset sometimes. And, we, and it's not always on purpose. You know, it just kind of happens. We don't think about it. But sometimes we lag in our excitement or our, our duty, I guess you could say, as a, as, a, as a disciple, that we can get caught up in the things of the world. We get busy. I may have mentioned that before also, too. But it's a good thing to be reminded of that because busyness can take us away from the things that he has for us in our mission as disciples. So that's also another reminder he's seeing here in Romans. Don't be lagging in zeal. Like, be fervent in the spirit. Don't go, well, I don't really think praying for him is really going to help. Or I don't think really going over and saying hello to that person over there or over here is really going to do any difference. So I'm just going to, I'll let someone else handle it. See, same theme there a little bit. Like, someone else that's more qualified can pray for them, you know. And, or, uh, or I'll just go over here. It'll be okay. That's not how it works. You're part of the body too. You have a function, even if it's not the same as someone else. Like me, I'm actually an introvert, but I love to talk to people and interact with people. You know, and um, no matter who you are, I'll, I might scare you sometimes. <laughs> Come up to you and say something. You're like, "Whoa, there's too much talk. <laughs> there's too much Garrett right here." <laughs> you know, like talking to you and everything. And if you're a new person or, or something or, or someone that you know and you're just like, oh, that's just Garrett. He'll be all right. But <laughs> we'll leave him over there. But, <laughs> but, um, but it's, okay to, it's okay to smile and laugh. I always try to get people to, to smile uh, because it's, it's, you actually have a more beautiful smile than you think, all of you guys. You know, it's, it's even, I know like where we're basket everything, but whatever you could see, someone smile, it's, it's beautiful. So it's no matter who you are. So that's one thing all of us have in the body too. You know, that, that we can't forget. But lastly, uh, for this section, Romans 12, jumping ahead a few verses, 12, 17, 18. So, um, repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to what is good in the eyes of all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you. Live in shalom with all people. So that's another thing, too, like I said, the hand being contentious with the rest of the body. And this can happen a lot uh, within the messianic uh, world. Uh, whether you're Messianic Gentile or Messianic Jew, a lot of times there can be contention with the rest of the body. And I've been guilty of that too. Um, you know, coming from the, the church world into the Messianic world and, and everything, we can, you can feel like, oh, well, I know more than, than you do or, um, or I'm living more devoutly than you. But also remember that parable of the, at the temple where the P Pharisee says, thank you, Father, for making me unlike this sinner over here. And I'm not comparing the rest of the body to sinners. Just bear with me a moment. I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm getting you into the mindset of don't think yourself higher. Just because that person's praying too, though. They're not just doing whatever. It's a sinner that's come back to ask for forgiveness. And the Pharisee is saying, thank you that I am pious. Thank you that I fast. That, that you filled my, my, my head full of knowledge of your word. And that you have not made me like this person. See the disconnect there? But that person is coming into repentance, and that is what he wants all humankind to do. So we cannot be like that, because that is counted as wickedness. That is counted as something that is not part of the body, to have that kind of mindset. So if someone's at a different spot than you, or that you have a different perspective in the body, that you should still work together, and that you should still come together in unity and work through things. You can teach each other things and actually show people, wow, that's really amazing. I didn't actually know that, you know, and... You can actually learn from one another and teach each other in peace and get along with all men, shalom with all people. So I'm actually going to show you a comparison on a content slide I have there uh, from Shekalim 3.2. That's uh, one of the um, parts from, I, I don't know if that was from the Mishnah or Talmud, to be honest with you. I got that from a commentary um, source. But compare the words of Shekalim 3.2, and that's speaking on Numbers 32.22. That's what it's commentating. The commentation is, one should be guiltless before other people as well as before God. For it says, and then the next slide, this is the actual scripture it's commentating on. And the, Lord, uh, and, the, <clears throat> and the land is subdued before Adonai. Then afterward, you may return and be free. Be free means guiltless, actually, too. Be, be, don't have the burden of guilt is the association there before Adonai and Israel. Then this territory will be your possession before Adonai. So again, we have the, the, this, this guilt 
you know. So the land has to be subdued by, by I don't know, that also lets us know in our own lives that he has to be in control, that he has to subdue what's in your life. Are you willing to give that up? Or are you going to rather hold on to the grief or the guilt that you have? And we all have times of guilt, no matter who we are. I have had guilt. I'm like, if only I said that better. I said something really silly the other day. I don't feel worthy of getting up here. And a lot of times I don't. I, I, I'm nervous coming up here and, 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 and praying, but I love it. I know that my focus goes to him, though. It's not about performance or anything. I'm just telling you personally, that's what I feel. But the, the amazing thing about that connection uh, is that I, I need to humble myself and let the Lord take control of the problems that are going on in my life that I can be blameless before him or not have that guilt around. It doesn't belong to me. The guilt doesn't belong to you either. It is a lie. It's not true. So many people feel um, guilty with something they may have done. As a result, they may choose to distance themselves from community or feel they need to get themselves right first before coming back and participating in community. We cannot wait to act or think that the community will reject us. Rather, we should turn from what we have done wrong and repent before Hashem and those who we may have transgressed against. We should all have the attitude too, like if I did something horrible to you, I would love you to tell me. And vice versa, that you could open about that and just say, I really didn't like the way you spoke to me. We shouldn't hold on to things and, and keep it secret. We should be open and be able to communicate. And that goes across the whole body of Messiah. And that's very difficult to do because we have to humble ourselves. Well, both sides have to humble themselves to hear that and respond. One is responding humbly. The other one is humbling himself to say, I'm sorry. They both work. They both require humility. And Second Chronicles 7, 13 through 4, 14. If I shut up heaven that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, when my people, over whom my name is called, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive the, uh, their sin and, the, and will heal their land. <coughs> Excuse me. And he will heal their land. So even then in Chronicles, it says that if you turn from your evil ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. And also the land itself, you always see that too, the land would vomit up the inhabitants that were committing atrocities on high places or they were doing things that they weren't supposed to do. The land itself had a grievance against the, the occupants. So you, it's interesting to say that the land, you know, the land will be healed from plague, from famine, from the rejection of the people that inhabit it. So all that can be restored just by turning back to him. But that does require a level of courage to a degree, but that's part of faith too. Uh, moving forward, Ezekiel 18, 14 through 17. Now behold, suppose, you know, this is really interesting too. Now behold, suppose he fathers a son. So this, this is a person that has committed sin. That's the context here. He fathers a son who gives, uh, to, um, who sees all his father's sins. So this is the son of the father. The father is the one that was doing bad things in his life. Uh, but this is the son seeing the sin, okay? He's the one that sees all his father's sins that he's committed and observing. However, does not do likewise. He does not eat at mountain shrines like those high places that you hear about. Or lift up the eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. Or defile his neighbor's wife. Nor does he uh, wrong anyone. Take uh, pledged property or commit robbery. But he gives his bread to the hungry. And covers the naked with a garment, withholds his hand from mistreating the poor, does not take interest or increase, practices my laws and, and walks in my statutes. He will not die from the iniquity of his father. He will surely live. This is another one, too, that's very common. And it's very unfortunate, too. And, and, and I've seen it a little bit in my life, too. A lot of people will feel guilty because they're like, well, my parents... That's how we raised and everything. I, I, didn't, I don't know what you know. It all goes back to that cycle again. So all this is connected about the fear. Fear and guilt are kind of related a little bit. Fear keeps you from doing. Guilt keeps you burdened. It keeps you from overriding the fear that, that allows you to conquer 
the promises that Yeshua has said that we would be con uh, that we would conquer. We're victors. We're not we're not victims because of who Yeshua is, and because we have the Holy Spirit in us, the Ruach Hakodesh. We can be forgiven. We just need to stop worrying about what we have done and focus on where we are heading in our lives individually and also as a community. Uh, we, are, we are very different. Now, this is kind of tying in what I said earlier about the different parts. We are very different in the body. We are unique and diverse. Many of us not only come from different backgrounds, but many have different gifts and blessings that have um, been given to each of us by our Elohim. He is glorified, and we are blessed when you act and use your gifts to bear fruit. They are multiplied because of him who works within you. So do not forget that. That is very important. Okay? And this isn't a lot of malarkey, you know, and stuff. I mean, this, this is real. Uh, spiritual gifts are a real thing. They weren't just for the days of the disciples or in the, the book of Acts. They're real. When you pray for someone, you're not just saying idle words. Even in Jewish prayer, there's a level of, of blessings. You never ever see a whole lot of um, focus towards yourself, but you do see the part where it says in the petition section, see there's Thanksgiving, which we just got out of too, yeah. Thanksgiving, petitioning, and blessing. You know, and there's different layers of blessing in all of them. But petitioning is a request. But all these things are real, all these spiritual gifts. You People can be healed. People can actually be delivered from demonic oppression. And people can speak a prophetic word over someone. These things exist even now. So 1 Corinthians 12, um, 14 through 20. Uh, let's see. For the body is not one part, but many. If the foot says, now this is what I was telling you about one little part saying it's the whole thing. Uh, Since I am not a hand, I'm not part of the body. Is it therefore not part of the body? And if the ear says, since I'm, I cannot, uh, since I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, is it for that reason any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? Well, that makes a lot of sense, too. That's one gift, but it can't override all of them. If the whole were hearing, um, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the parts, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But now there are many parts, yet one body. So the next slide, uh, continuing with that, 12, 21 through 25. The eye cannot tell the hand, I don't see you. Or in turn the head to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, these parts are of the body that seem to be less important are indispensable. Those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our unrepresentative, unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no such need. Rather, God assembled the body, giving more honor to those who are lacking, so that there may be no division in the body. But so the parts may have the same care for one another. And I'm concluding now. So that's really important. Like I said, it goes back to guilt, fear, and unity in the body. All these parts have a purpose. So that's the running theme here that we're seeing. And they are related because, like I was saying too, if you're, if you're kept back from doing what God has called you to do, or if you hear that, even if you don't hear, you know, but you, you're, you're getting that from God that you're, that you've been praying about something, and he's, te he's telling you, I really want you to do this. And you keep praying and abiding in him and following him, and he keeps pressing in and telling you this. It's something that, that, that he's trying to tell you. you know, that is real. Bearing fruit is done by abiding in Yeshua. So this is something that we all can do. We all abide fruit, no matter if you feel worthy or not. But what are you doing? in your life what, it, what are you trying to seek to do are you trying to do things your way and just see where you can get just being a good person which is good it's good to be a good person but that's not enough you have to give him everything you have to give him your whole self that's why like in worship too like especially in this walk uh, dance is done a lot because we sing praises 
We use our hands to worship. We also use our whole bodies to worship before the Lord in a reverent way. Our whole being, not just our words, proclaim his greatness and, and have joy. And that is a fruit of sorts, too. In concluding, uh, conclusion, John 15, 4, Abide in me and I will abide in you. The branch cannot itself um, produce fruit unless it abides on the vine. Likewise, you cannot produce fruit unless you abide in me. So that makes sense, too, if, especially if you know anything about growing gardens and, or if you have vineyards or fruit trees and things. The fruit grows off the fans of the branches, within the branches, not, the, the, not independently. There's nothing to hold it on if, if it doesn't, you know, also from the blossoms that, that germinate and they, they turn into fruit later. That whole process was established. But the fruit, you may have been asking, well, what is spiritual fruit? I know what real fruit is, but what is the, the fruit of the Spirit? And Galatians 5, 22 through 23 tells us. But the fruit of the Ruach, that's the breath of God, the Spirit of God, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. There is no law of Hashem. There's no law that abides in Him or any of His statutes that go against these principles or these attributes of fruit. They work in unison with his law and his foundation. And that rich soil that he planted his people in was to abide, but also that, that all the nations could have that through Yeshua, like Esther was saying earlier. And I thank you very much for that opportunity, and I want to encourage all of you today that if you have been feeling um, disconnected, uh, personally, interpersonally, or with Hashem, it's never too late to give, to give yourself over to that and just keep focusing in on him don't be weighed down by guilt or fear but be part of the community because we love you guys and not just because of that and we actually en enjoy seeing all of you guys it's actually a real joy it's not a fake smile it's it's real but we're not here just just for that reason we're here to worship before our father in heaven together and we can sharpen each other and support each other in that unity and that everyone has a part to play and Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys.